So I think we can start. Nobody's joining, so nobody more is joining. So I'm share my screen and uh, jump right into the session. It's a, a Reaper session as usual. Okay, this is the Reaper session. Um, as usual, I'll share the computer sound. Uh, could you please let me know if you hear correctly the audio? Yes, great. Great, is it too loud? Do I have to lower the master? Could you please let me know? If it sounds right? Okay, because uh, I'm, maybe I'm going to talk on the music uh, and if, if it's too loud, uh, of course, you can't hear me. So let me know if you, if you can hear me, fine. Otherwise, I will put the master down. So. Uh, this is our drum kit, as I, as I told you. Let me put the headphones on so I can hear something too. As you can hear, the, um, the recording of the drums has been made already with the right, right levels. I mean, there is no uh, overhead that are too high or the kick too high or too low. So it's uh, already balanced. It's very natural sounding drum kit, but as you can hear, the room is completely dry. So uh, there is no tail, no reverberation, nothing. I think this is a pretty common situation in uh, home recording when you don't have a treated room, you don't have uh, the right room to record drums. Maybe you don't usually record drums, and, uh, but you have to do it sometime, from time to time, and um, you end up doing that in an untreated room with uh, no right reverberation for drums that need uh, high ceiling uh, and a spacey room to make the drum breathe. Uh, so as being an uh, acoustic instrument, uh, they need to interact with the room and, with, uh, and um, uh, enhance the sound with the sound of the room. So if the room is too dead, like it's in this case, uh, we don't have uh, um, boomy kick, we don't have uh, um, long tail in the, on the snare. We, we don't have uh, anything, we, we just have the heat and that's it. So if I let you hear the room microphone. You see, that's pretty dead. There is no reverberation in this room microphone. So what we use here is to, to record the kick drum with two microphones one inside and uh, memory helps uh, it's uh, an audix d6 then we have uh, the outside microphone right in front of the kick drum this one is looking straight at beta uh, this one is um, inside uh, right in front of uh, of the of the kick drum and uh, it's a condenser mic but i actually don't remember the model, but it's pretty cheap mic. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Shure 57 uh, on, the, on, on the snare and below the snare. Then, uh, when, uh, Tony D, when you have a mic on each drum, what's the purpose of a room mic as well? Well, uh, mm, this is a, a, a basic uh, microphone technique. Uh, uh, since the drums is not different instrument, but it's just one instrument made of uh, different pieces, uh, when you uh, record that, if you only record spot microphones, 
you get fake sound. You don't get the sound that you uh, are used to hear when you are in the room because you are hearing the room when you hear the drums in the room. So uh, the purpose of the room microphone, we usually uh, you can use one or two microphones, depends on how wide you want that room, is uh, to capture the whole sound of the drum kit in the space so you can use it together with uh, spot microphones to get an organic sound for the room. It's essential to the sound of the drum kit. Uh, in this case, I've used uh, a mono room because for, um, for this kind of genre that uh, it's very rock oriented, uh, we want uh, the drums to be very focused. And, usually, and sometimes when you use two different mics spaced uh, or in uh, XY um, configuration, uh, you, you you get a more uh, washy room sound, a stereo sound that is not always uh, what you want. So in this case, I have uh, chosen to use one microphone. So uh, the regular 57 on snare up and snare down. Then we have uh, a studio electronics something. Uh, can remember the model on the on the hi hat. Um, 57 on the tom, uh, Sennheiser 421 on the foam floor, and then we have Neumann KM84 on, pan, on uh, overheads, and then we have a uh, Rode NT2 used as a room microphone. Uh, used on, uh, in, if I don't remember, if I remember well, omnidirectional mode. Uh, so it's not a cardioid configuration, it's omnidirectional to catch to capture all the room. So, with this mm, set of mics, we have this uh, natural sounding drum, but it's definitely too weak, too uh, dead, too much. So, the first thing I'm gonna do is to work on the room microphone because that's what gives me the overall sound. And since this is what this was supposed to capture the ambience of um, of the room, we are going to put a reverb on that, just on that microphone. So I will put our spaces on that. And this is the modern interface. You can choose between three different interfaces in space. Spaces. Um, what I'm going to do is to use uh, uh, the dry wet to balance uh, the amount of reverb and choose a fairly large room because I want to simulate a very large room so uh, these are by the way these dimensions here if you look on the web you can find that are very close when you choose large and uh, put six six meters on the edge of the ceiling uh, you will find that these dimensions are very close to the um, room B in Ocean Way Studios in LA so just out of curiosity, this is a, a, a fairly large room. So we will put diffusion at 100% because we want a very diffuse sound. Uh, we want more damping than this. We don't want long tail of the, of the room, just have a, a little bit more reverberation on the room microphone. Then we reduce the amount of low or low end and a little bit of highs. So let's hear how does it sound.
Oh, by the way, I have reduced the stereo to zero because since it is a mono room mic, it should have captured in the first place a mono reverb, reverb uh, in the room. So I've set the stereo to zero to have a mono reverberation. Uh, want to increase the accuracy. Okay, this, we have now our room microphone. Okay, you say that volume, uh, that's because I think the room mic is not that high in level in the first place, but I can increase the master. So let me know if you hear it. So you hear the differences. I, we have put the room microphone inside a wider space. So we have simulated uh, what should have been captured in the first place if the drums would have been recorded in uh, a larger and proper room. Um, because the, the closed microphones, I mean the snare microphone, won't never catch the room sound because it's so close to the, to the snare that it's, in, it's impossible that it catches the room around it. So uh, we just have to add reverberation to the room mic instead, instead of uh, uh, reverb to every single uh, microphone in the kit or having a, a sand uh, for a kick and snare to an external reverb return. Uh, this is much more effective in giving natural sound. And if I now put it back in context with the full drums, you already will be able to hear a more uh, spacey sound uh, and more full sounding drum kit. Okay, these already give us a better sounding uh, uh, Tony, you ask, uh, notice that most of your tracks seem to be from live recordings, but if we were using instrument plugins, would you still recommend bouncing the audio from MIDI to WAV files before doing any processing like adding a rubber compression file? No, that's not needed, uh, of course. Uh, it depends, of course, of how, uh, on how you are, about, you are used to work. Um, if you bounce the output from the instrument to a WAV file, you are saving the CPU from that instrument. So uh, you can save some CPU if you bounce the track. I usually uh, do production on um, one project and mixing in another project. That, but that's because uh, I'm used to work like that. Uh, from the old recording, uh, the old analog recording days, because uh, when I started, uh, um, when I started recording, uh, I was using uh, uh, tape in the first place, then uh, uh, digital audio tape, and uh, and then our disc recording. But everything was coming from keyboards or real recording or samplers. So I had an old uh, Akai S2000 that was giving me headache every day. And so I, 
I recorded those track uh, in, uh, in the dough or in my old tape recorder and then started mixing from there. So that's why I'm used to work like this. But of course, if your uh, computer handles that and uh, you are comfortable working uh, on everything on the same session, why not? You can work directly from the, from the instruments. Uh, but the, the approach is different because uh, you have to understand if you want a real sound or a fake sound. Uh, if you want real sound like this, the best thing you can do is to record real drums. But if you have uh, to use uh, um, uh, virtual instruments that simulate the, uh, a real drummer, and like uh, for Easy Drummer or... I don't, I don't remember the names now. I use so rarely those things. Um, you'd better be... Uh, su superior, you better s start thinking about how can I make them look real. So what I would have done if this was a real drum kit uh, and use a, bram, use a room track, uh, it's one of those things. So I would definitely put, take everything, every output, put it on a stereo track and uh, fake a room uh, track with uh, some reverb mm. and so on like like we are doing right now so um, but i always prefer to work with real drum unless i'm doing some electronic tracks uh where i of course use everything from samples and electronic drums so uh, i don't need to work like this uh, the approach is completely different because you have a synthetic sound. Usually you don't have to compress unless uh, you want uh, um, some specific sound that the compressor gives you. Uh, you just have to EQ and the first best thing you can do from the beginning is not to EQ at all, but create the sample um, as, uh, as close uh, as what you have in mind. So if you need uh, the beater from uh, a, a synthetic kick drum, uh, Create that in the first place while designing the sound, not trying to uh, add it back with an equalizer. Uh, so you can of course layer a lot of sound, uh, one for the one for the body of the kick, one for the beater, one for the low end, uh, and so on. And then once you're happy, you export your sample and use it in your sampler. So you have m much more freedom. Uh, this will uh, help you not to use equalizer, for example. Because every time you, you use an equalizer, a compressor, or something, you are actually ruining your, your sound because you are uh, changing a phase relationship, you are introducing a distortion. You are, so that's, that's something, unless it's, a, a, it's a, an artistical choice, I don't know if that's the right word, uh, you, you'd better keep less, less processing as possible. Yes, Tony, uh, you, if you use virtual, drum, uh, virtual drums like those software, uh, like Superior Drummer, BFD, uh, whatever, um, you will definitely need to use separate tracks because each of the sound have to go to its own process. Uh, processing, uh, uh, otherwise you won't be able to tweak correctly everything, uh, unless, unless I don't know, mm, unless those samples are already evenly processed, maybe. So they are ready to ready to be mixed. But if you can adjust uh, the distance of the microphones, for example, uh, the kind of microphones like some software allows you, I don't think they are too processed. So anyway. Let's back to our session. Um, now with the, with this room uh, with this room reverberation added, uh, we can start to concentrate on um, on single tracks. Uh, let's keep on going with the room. I will uh, equalize that. Totally Q. Uh... 
Okay, that's great. That's great, L Ludovico. I test the space uh, with basses, reverb, with classic instruments, sample, and orchestral drums. Uh, yeah, it's okay. It's designed to create a simple room, not complicated, but uh, it's work. It's work fine, in, in my opinion. And we are preparing a new model, the Vanset model. I don't know if when will be available, but uh, it's. Uh, starts from the same principle of the digital wave guide and uh, gives you a little bit more flexibility and uh, should add more uh, more um, realism let's say uh, simulating more the reflection in different room uh, uh, you can choose uh, you will be able to choose uh, um, the amount of reflection from each of the um, of the walls so it's a little, little bit more flexible mm. anyway now uh, let's get back to our room and microphone. I will solo that. First thing I'm gonna do is to remove the rumble with our standard 18 dB octave H pass. Um, I don't want the kick to, to interfere too much with the room, so I'm gonna put this up above 100 Hz. Then I'm going, I'm going uh, fast because it is pretty pretty much standard stuff then I'll give some air to the drums uh, like this with 6 dB at uh, around 300,000 kilohertz so let's hear some problem here because I see a lot of um, um, wait Tony asks uh, Tony asks uh, if it's best to a cue before or after the reverb in this case since we are uh, simulating a room that should have been captured by the mic um, in the first place we are uh, equalizing after the reverb if you use uh, uh, a send return configuration, uh, a standard send return configuration, and you have your reverb on the on the return, and you're sending from each of your tracks to that reverb. Of course, you should send after you have uh, your equalization and compression made. Uh, but of course, if the reverb sound uh, it's not right, you don't like uh, the overall reverb. Uh, that's fine. Adding an equalizer after the reverb on the return track. So you can shape the sound of the reverb without affecting the original sound. So I'm not sure I'm going to keep all this thing over here. I try to put a dynamic filter and see if I can clean it a little bit more. That's around uh, here. Let's see what's, what's happened. I like that. Uh, with this uh, dynamic filter, I'm removing uh, the body of the snare mainly because uh, I don't want it to crowd uh, the, the room microphone there. I want to have it just for ambience. So when I will be adding uh, the direct microphone of the snare, uh, we risk having too much mud in this area. So it's better to remove it first. Then uh, we will drastically compress the room to bring out um, the sound of the room. So I'm using Multicom Plus. Uh, I'm 
using the Multicom Plus with um, FAT, FAT, micro FAT uh, compressor. I want it, I set it to 20 watts, so 22 watts, so it's a very aggressive compression, and I want it to compress a lot, let's say a lot. So I am putting the auto input and I uh, want it to compress at least uh, 12 dB auto. So let's make it adjust everything itself. So here we are, this is our room sound, equalized and compressed, ready to be brought back into the drum kit. So this is already more, uh, more, more good sounding. Let's get go to the kick now. And uh, we first add a gate. I'm using a Reaper's gate because uh, this allows me to create a nice trick. And I'm going to show you. But first, what, I, what I'm going to do, sorry, forgot about that, is to look at phase relationship between inner and uh, outside kick microphone. If you look closely to the recording, you see that they are out of phase. When the inside microphone goes down, the outside goes up. So to fix this, we are using phase reversal from for one of the two microphones. So we reverse the phase of the outside microphone in this case. So we bring everything back into coherence. And uh, because otherwise, when uh, the, the sound of the, of the, the two mics is sound, they are canceling, so we get less impact. So here, here the difference. Putting everything in phase is the right, first thing to do when you have multiple microphones uh, recording the same source. So uh, now with this gate, I'm going to send a MIDI note on open close so we can uh, trigger a sample. In this case, uh, I want to send a lower note and I'll show you why. Uh, sorry, 40. Um, let's set up the gate. Okay, just Jacek. I don't know your name. Just Jacek. Hopefully, ask uh, you. Do you usually align the phase of the of the overheads to the phase of direct mix? Uh, some people do that. I don't usually like that because everything starts to sound uh, too processed, too precise. Precise. I don't know. 
Uh, I like uh, the drum to sound more natural, but that's my personal preference. Um, somebody does that. I've seen, I've seen a lot of person, a lot of um, engineer do that. Uh, I'm not that, I'm not, I'm not fond of that of that technique. But uh, to do that, you should uh, take one point inside your recording. Let's say this kick here and then analyze each of the tracks. Um, for example, the panoramics should have something in, in here. Uh, let's take the snare, maybe it's more visible. You see the kick drum is a little bit behind because uh, uh, the distance of the panoramics from the kick drum uh, uh, is uh, wider than the other uh, mix in the um, in the kick, in the kit, so uh, the, the sound takes a while to reach that microphone, and this in, in turn uh, create a little bit of delay. Of delay, uh, but these, uh, in my opinion, create the natural sounding of the of the kit. So I'm not fixing that. Uh, will never do that. Uh, first, because it takes a lot of time, <laughs> and second, because uh, I don't I don't like the overall the end, uh, the, the final effect. Uh, it's everything to so process, so process that uh, you should have used a uh, uh, fake uh, drum recording in the first place. Uh, when I'm using a real drummer, I want it to feel real. I don't want uh, it to feel like I'm, I'm using a, um, a sample if I have a real drummer and real recording. Uh, yes, if you align that a lot, uh, you you lose the human feeling, the and the real, the room feeling, the acoustic feeling of the recording. In my opinion, uh, now I have this gate set up. Okay, it's just for trigger the sample, so I want to put the dry signal back in. Okay. Now we are using the rear gate as a trigger. I'm not using gates or expanders uh, uh, too because uh, the sound, the, this kit is really clean. The recording of this kit is really clean. And uh, we don't need to go hyper precise. Uh, we usually do that on live situation to avoid spill uh, in the microphone from other sources. Uh, but this is uh, a studio recording, so I don't think there is a need to use uh, gates, expanders, or, or, or so on. And we now create a, a, a synthetic drum kick. I like to use an old VST, but of course you can use whatever you want to do this, because uh, I want to add a little bit more body to the kick drum so what I do is to take the Innovation V-Station with the standard press, the, 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 the init preset, and now I'll create a, a kick drum.
okay, we are not getting the right kicks from the gate. Here we are. Now fix this sound. Here we are. This is the natural uh, sounding kick. This is the one with the augmented synth. We given it more low end and more thump. Okay, here we are. So, um, Daryl asks, uh, do you recalibrate the timing of Reaper before working on drama is the one time thing? I don't know what you understand, honestly, what you mean, honestly. Um, uh, I have everything recorded uh, with the right tempo in the first place, of course. Uh, so everything uh, is uh, on the grid in, uh, in Reaper. The drummer is a good drummer, so it's uh, keeping the right tempo, it's not, not floating too much. Uh, every hit is almost uh, on the right place, so I haven't fixed anything in the, in the recording. Uh, Christoph asks, uh, why synth instead of sample from original kick? Uh, because uh, um, I'm looking for a modern sound, while being acoustic, I'm looking for a modern sound, and I need uh, a lot of low end and a lot of thump, and only a synth is able to deliver that. Uh, of course, you can use uh, uh, an 88 NATO 8 sample that you like if you have it one. I like to create everything from scratch, so um, I'm an um, electronic uh, musician and sound designer in the first place, so that's, my, that's natural for me to have this approach. Um, and uh, I am, I'm augmenting, I'm improving the original sound with this synth for uh, this reason. Now, if I go on, now I have uh, like it was uh, our, the original sound, okay? Now I'm gonna to use the Total EQ to uh, to increase, uh, to equalize, uh, sorry, the kick. I'm going drastic because I want uh, a real hard beating kick. So I'm going with a very strong EQ. So uh, like uh, we probably uh, know Chris Lord LG and like he likes to say nobody has ever dead never die from using too much EQ, so don't be shy with the equalizer if it's needed. And so we start with this preset. I don't know where the kick is actually, so I start with randomly with a standard uh, kick equalization. So let's see what happens. So let me check one thing because there's one thing I haven't checked. If the original kick has the, the same frequency as the synth one we have added. So I'm around uh, 50 hertz 
around here. So if I add it back, no, it's too low. So what I'm going to do is to use the Dachiun control to put it back where I want. Or the same one, let's see. Here it is. So now we have the original kick and the synth kick uh, with the same re bass resonance. And now we can also lower it because it's too prominent. Okay. Here we are. Let's try to put out the pizza sound. Okay. Okay, here we are. This is right, I like this. And then we add again multi-comp plus MK2 and using the same compressor we set the input, the output and compress 6 dB with a slow attack time and a fast release time we do that because uh, in this way, the compressor is more aggressive and pulls out the attack sound while keeping the body of the, of the kick drum. Okay, we can also use a four, per, four times over sampling here because uh, this is a very fast compressor. Okay, this is it. Uh, I don't know if you like that, I like this sound. So, uh, we now put back the snare and we do the same thing to the snare. We first check the phase relationship between the two microphones and uh, already done that. One of them should be out of phase. Okay, we need to zoom closely. Wait a moment. Okay. You see the same thing happens here. So we need to reverse the phase of one of the two. I usually do that with the, with the bottom uh, one. And uh, here is the snare alone. You see the snare is very small. It doesn't have any tail and it's very short, so we need to create the tail that it doesn't have. Uh, we already did that to uh, a certain extent using the room microphone, but we want to do it uh, uh, on the mic itself, so, on the sound itself, sorry. So we use the same gate, and we start to trigger the sound, send our MIDI notes. We don't really care about the MIDI note here since uh, we are going to use a white noise and we do the same thing we did before. I take my V station but uh, I'll select 
just the noise. Okay, we now create a fake uh, tail for the snare drum. First, choose the 12 dB octave filter and the right frequency, right cutoff frequency. Then we have the release. And we can also create some envelope modulation. And using the dry wet knob in Reaper, I can dial in the amount of uh, tail I want to add to the snare. So, you can hear I have uh, added a little bit more tail. Now I will probably lower it down because it's definitely too much. Make it a little bit darker. Okay, I have more tail now. And uh, if I disable that, you can clearly hear the difference. Now, on to mixing itself. So, total EQ. Remove everything below uh, 100 Hz because uh, we don't need that on the snare drum. Make it more brighter. Okay, like this, maybe. And give back a little bit of the body. So I create a sort of a smiley cue. Okay, maybe now it's too much of that synth sound, so Let's make it a little bit more or less. Yeah, uh, Mario, uh, you will change the snare tuning. I would do that too, uh, but it's, it's a small snare. This particular drummer uh, like to have this small funky snare. It's tall like this. So uh, it's a very high tuned snare. And uh, I need to fix that because it will never work in the context. So I need to create something um, that works more. Uh, to tune the snare, I would probably have to uh, change its pitch. So I would need to have a, a, a pitch shifter probably. I don't know how it would sound. I don't want to risk to sound uh, too, too fake. Uh, let's see what, what, what happens if uh, we add it now. Uh, I never use pitch shifter, so I don't even know if I have one. Uh, I don't think I have one, unless Reaper has one uh, in its uh, standard plugin collection, rear pitch, probably this one. Uh, let's see what happens if I do that. Like this? Is it better? Yeah, definitely. Okay, like this, like this, I like it. 
then compress everything. I also like the FET compressor here with more relaxed attack, more tight attack, sorry. So it's nicer sound, definitely nicer sound. Do you remember the original sound of the snare? And uh, we came up with this. And if we mix it with the room microphone, We already have a nicer sounding kit. Now we need to concentrate on the overheads. So this is uh, the overheads in their natural sounding state. I'm gonna mix it in context, mix them in context, because I want uh, uh, to make sure I'm not uh, creating some conflicts. So I'm mixing them in context now. Uh, with total EQ first. This high shelf, uh, not just and li like an high shelf, of course, uh, because I'm uh, lifting the high frequency. In this uh, case, we are lifting the level of the cymbals and the hi hats. So I'm using this instead of the fader to bring the hi hats at the right level with the snare. Now I'm removing uh, this peak here where the heat of the snare is because uh, since we uh, tuned the snare, I don't want the original tuning of the snare to be uh, too prominent, otherwise uh, uh, we may create some uh, uh, strange uh, resonance together. So uh, let me remove this with an equalizer. By the way, I simply choose the cue with looking at the width of the, uh, of the peaks over here. So it's uh, just a, an optical uh, thing. Uh, this is uh, the advantage of having uh, uh, some graphical equalizer like Total EQ or many of the others on the market, of course, because you can clearly see where the issues are and uh, act accordingly. So give a gentle compression to the overheads. We don't want to compress that too much because uh, we, uh, otherwise we lose too much dynamics. Uh, the LHUA is perfect for this. I'm going to use that in dual mono mode because uh, uh, using a dual mono, dual mono, I can make the stereo wider since I don't, I don't have the sidechain link together. So if uh, 
uh, one microphone needs to be compressed more than the other. This is going to happen and uh, this uh, micro variation makes uh, uh, the stereo uh, panorama wider. And of course, you have seen I have uh, hard panned the, the panoramics, uh, the overhead, sorry, uh, left and right. And uh, I usually do that. Somebody uh, you, likes more an arrow setting. Uh, I like to have them uh, hard left and not hard, hard right. It's a, a, a personal preference. There's not a fixed rule. Uh, I'm going for 3 dBs of peak reduction, not more. And uh, I don't want to have uh, analog grid or something, so I stick with zero VU in the input. Uh, set everything auto, so the plugin does everything by itself. So here we are. This is our overheads. Uh, I think they are ready, ready fine. Keep in mind we were coming from this. This is the processed sound and this is the unprocessed sound. Much better. Now we just need to bring back the hi-hat microphone. Cut the low end, of course. We need to, the low end needs to be cleared because only the kick drum must be there. Uh, no other instruments in the, the drum kit have to occupy the space of the kick drum. Uh, just rumble is there. So, Cut everything always, and uh, of course our high shelf. Sorry, our high shelf uh, to make everything more bright. Uh, acoustic microphones, acoustic instrument, and uh, real in in microphones tend to be uh, darker than what we are used to in recording. So everything has to, has to be made brighter. So let me hear the i hat. Of course, I do that in context. Uh, we remove uh, the snare from here too. We have uh, panned that on the right side. We just need to use this microphone to make the hi-hat uh, uh, present in one point in the stereo space, not too, not too bright, not too high in level. Yeah, sure, you, we can hear only the hi-hat. It's just a reinforcement microphone, the sound of the, the cymbals comes from the overhead. Oh, sorry, okay, here. And this is just to reinforce the position in the stereo panorama of the... Uh, Mario, uh, Mario ask, didn't you... Uh, didn't you use a specific uh, microphone that I had? You use uh, Neumann K KM184. I used that, them, uh, used that, those microphones for the overheads, and I didn't have any more Neumann KM184. So I use a uh, uh, Studio Electronics uh, 
Uh, I don't remember which one. It's another small condenser microphone. And um, I would have liked to use... Uh, I would have liked to use uh, AKG414 for overheads, but I wasn't able to find, find them uh, for this recording, so I relied on small uh, diaphragm, uh, the Neumann or small diaphragm. I, I prefer use, uh, I prefer use uh, um, um, larger diaphragm, diaphragm for the overheads because I can capture more of the kit. Uh, <clears throat> You use two microphone wires, a 57 and a KM 184. That's something I never tried, uh, honestly. Well, you see, seem really overkill. Three microphones on the, on the hi hat, Mario. That's uh, something I never tried, honestly, because uh, I think you have a lot of phase issue with that. You need to be very careful uh, with how you, you place the microphones, I think. So, uh, do you think you, you give you get uh, really a better sounding kit using uh, three microphones of that? Uh, honestly, I've used uh, three microphones of snare one time, but uh, in the mix I discard the, the side one because it was really not adding uh, anything to the sound I wanted. So, mm, I think uh, I think two microphone kick it's a must two microphones there, it's a must. Uh, then the other are... Yeah, sometimes I recorded this, the hi-hats on the bottom too, with a 57, because I wanted a more uh, trashy sound from the, from the hi-hats, and it was a, a really, really uh, thick hi-hat that had uh, a very... I don't know the words, uh, but I think you understand. You ha it had a very metallic and heavy sound, so uh, the the 57 on the back worked uh, worked fine. Uh, for this recording, I went pretty standard, honestly. So uh, that that's what I did. Uh, I also use uh, use the hi hat mic uh, just to just to add, uh, just to give um, a perspective in the stereo. Yeah, I, I appreciate your you sharing your technique. And uh, I'll probably try that when, uh, when, I, when I have time, when I, the next recording, I don't know when it will be, but, but uh, it's something I can, I can try. Uh, once I see, I've seen uh, a professional recorded um, drums from a top Italian um, uh, uh, singer, let's say, uh, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not going to to share the name, but uh, I've seen the Pro Tools multi-track multi session. I was in the studio with the engineer and uh, there were something like 21 mics on the, um, on the drum itself. So pretty, pretty, pretty heavy. Something that's not really, really easy to manage and you have to have a, a very good room to handle all, the, all those mics, but that those drums were recorded by a top drummer, not an Italian drummer, and uh, recorded in one of the top studio. You probably know the Phonoprint in Bologna, so uh, they were going. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Twenty-one mics. That exactly twenty. <laughs> you you picked up the right engineer and the right drummer and. Uh, that was overkill, definitely, in my opinion. Um, but for our purpose, this is a small kit uh, with um, with a definitely desperate recording technique here. Uh, we don't have a good sounding drum, and uh, we don't have a good sounding room, and uh, the aim of this. Uh, this uh, session here is to save a bad recording because I think uh, if you have a top engineer, top uh, drummer, uh, a top recording studio, uh, you you probably know how to mix drums and how to to, to get professional results. So uh, maybe it's more appropriate in this case to have. Uh, 
are not, not sounding uh, something that doesn't sound right in the first place and we need to, to make it sound uh, appropriate. I don't know if uh, you understand what, what I'm saying. Uh, I, I know that if you have uh, the, the budget, the room and everything, <laughs> you can do uh, wonderful mic, mic positioning, wonderful recording and, and so on. So uh, to close this, uh, this session, because uh, we are almost at the end, uh, Antonio asked, uh, would be better to use a dynamic EQ over the snare peak? Uh, probably, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, I like to play it safe in this case, and I want to clean up everything uh, because uh, there's something I don't need. Uh, so I prefer to, to clean up everything. Um, Harmonics, we can try harmonics. Yeah, we can try harmonics on the snare. Why not? Why not? So let's go back to the snare. We have, uh, I usually don't compress the, the hi-hat uh, because there's uh, no really need. Uh, it's a reinforcement microphone, so uh, I don't want to create a specific sound with that. But uh, let's go to harmonics. Let's see if it helps on the snare. No, this is the old one, sorry. Um, Harmonix Pro, uh, here it is. So, let's see if it helps on the snare. What we can do is to use the exciter to get some uh, uh, more harmonics, more crack. If you start with the highest harmonic, you already have uh, more crack from that. I like to have uh, even harmonics uh, to create this effect because uh, they uh, looks they hear that it looks like more distortion. I don't know if it's the right word. Lightly, slowly add uh, harmonics and see what happens. I like the first. This removes too much of the body. Okay, these, if I go, because uh, this plugin has the ability to, uh, to go uh, positive and negative, let's say, when you go with harmonic on the negative side, you are actually adding the harmonic uh, with um, in counter phase, so you have uh, the phase rotated by 180 degrees. So you are actually subtracting the harmonic from uh, the the sound, uh, and so it uh, gives a, a little bit different equalization. the master control when I lower this when I, I set this to zero sorry uh, I don't have any harmonic added to the sound when I set this uh, to 100% I have all these like I set when I set this to negative 100% this, everything is reversed so uh, it's flipped in polarity, so you can uh, change uh, the harmonic content, uh, the overall harmonic content with the slider. So I'm gonna dial back some of the excitement here. Something like this. And let me hear before and after.
yeah, we definitely added some, th some grit, some um, dusty sound. <laughs> uh, we can do this uh, trick too. We have uh, a pre-emphasis and the emphasis filter. So what, what that is means? It means that uh, we have an equalizer before the uh, uh, exciter and before the clipper and the opposite equalizer after that. So if I, for example, uh, increase uh, the amount of high frequency here, we are gonna hit the excitement with this EQ curve and then uh, we have uh, the de-emphasis filter that is same curve but on the opposite direction to bring everything back to flat. So we are, in this case, saturating more the highs than the lows. Uh, Tony asks uh, if Harmonix Pro have any preset built in. Yes, of course. Have a look at that. There are quite a bunch of presets that you can try. And then let me let me hear how it sounds. Sorry, uh, I have Reaper auto muted the track. This is something that may happen when you do trick like this. No, that's really too much, and Reaper got the track auto muted. Okay, we are acting like an EQ, saturating more the high frequencies, and so having a. Uh, but this is going. This, we are adding too much harmonics, and uh, Reaper goes uh, into protection mode. Better to reduce the output level. plugin we can create uh, fast peaks uh, that are problematic for uh, to be handled by the, the, the dose so let me instead of boosting the high frequency let me reduce the lows and we should be fine we can also add the clipper to get more distortion out of that. Here we are. We also use the new plugin for the drum kit. And uh, okay, I haven't used the the, high, the, um, the tom. And the tom for uh, the fourth tom is not present in this song, so we can mute those tracks. And uh, remember where we were coming from. This is the original sound. And this is the processed one. So we definitely got a better sounding drum kit. Maybe the kick, synth kick is too loud. Let me lower it a little bit.
yes, the bypass sound has, of course, a lower, uh, uh, a lower, a lower output. The kick, we can lower it a little bit. Well, actually, it's not lower. Uh, it's just the perceived loudness is different because we compress the hell out of the kit. You see, it peaks uh, the, the same levels. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Antonio, it's uh, too present, too present. Okay, okay, that's right. Uh, just uh, lowering that. Definitely a better, a better sounding drum kit. Yeah, Mario, I know, I know. It's just uh, this was just an example. It needs to. We need to uh, take more care about the gates to make it more consistent. Because uh, I've noticed that sometimes not every every hit is uh, uh, considered by the gates. I need to, of course, uh, tweaking uh, tweak that correctly so that uh, uh, the synth uh, kick uh, is always. Uh, uh, starting in the right time uh, and on every hit that is not always happening uh, right now but you get the idea uh, you get the idea we are just demonstrating the plugins here not creating the complete mix but uh, the starting point was almost desperate and we got uh, a nice sounding kit usable at least uh, on uh, a modern rock context so and we use the honor plugins and some stock plugin from reaper but of course if you use another do you can you you have a gate that uh, sends a midi note and can trigger a sample or a synth and uh, of course you have a reverb you have whatever uh i think i think you i've, I've used it, uh, plugins that everyone everyone has access to so uh that's it that's it. Uh, harmonics can also be used on the kick drum if you want to get more of the beta, for example. I think we can use that with good results uh, just using the, um, the parenthesis filter. Let me try that. Also, harmonics can be used to uh, create a fake tape effect. Uh, let, me, let me show that on the kick drum. If I use harmonics pro with uh, press a tape, what does the tape press it do is to use the pre-emphasis and the emphasis, increasing the saturation in the high frequency and uh, it uh, hits a clipper and the hysteresis uh, effect uh, uh, creates the memory of, uh, of the tape so when, uh, uh, when the, the tape is hit with a high level signal uh, it get magnetized and uh, it keeps on saturating even if the signal uh, dro drops down. Um, 
and uh, this is uh, almost how our tape plugin works. Uh, of course, the Sphere is, is more correct in that context. You have a different kind of web shaper than standard clipper, but you get the idea. And uh, this is how it sounds. Okay, and here we are creating a little bit more beater and getting more body, more overall level from the kick without audible distortion using this, uh, this trick here. Here the difference. This is gain compensated, so we are not full, being fooled by different levels. We're just getting more harmonics, more body, more sound from the kick. So this plugin is subtle, but can make a difference when you use it uh, uh, the right way. So, this was, the, well, this was it. I think uh, there's not much more to do. Uh, it's quite a, longer, quite, quite a long webinar. It's uh, one hour and a half, so I hope you had fun and uh, le learned something uh, if uh, I have taught you something. Uh, otherwise, I uh, hope you had fun and uh, maybe see the plugin in action, see a different perspective on what you already know how to do. And um, if uh, you don't, didn't know how to mix drum, I hope this helped you. Uh, of course, I'm not a top mixer in the world, but uh, I, I'm having fun doing that, and I hope uh, you have too. So, this has been recorded. You'll be able to watch it on YouTube, of course. Have fun, have a good rest of the day, rest of the night, whatever you are. Uh, See you next month. We are doing one webinar at month, so, uh, each month. So if you have a question, if you want to want me to talk about specific topic or something like that, just let me know so we can arrange one on, uh, on your favorite topic. So thank you very much and uh, have a nice rest of the day. Ciao a tutti. Ciao.